Well, good morning, friends. I, wel- I welcome you all to our Good Friday service and a very warm welcome to those who are perhaps visiting us this morning. We gather to celebrate the work of God on the cross of Jesus Christ this morning. And I invite you to bring yourself into an awareness of the presence of God as we share together in the, in the gathering, the call to worship on Good Friday. From a world which puts a premium on getting, we come to worship the one who puts a premium on giving. From a world of saviors who scarcely shed blood for saints, we come to worship the Savior who shed his blood for sinners. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before Christ our Lord. Let us praise him who died for us that we might live for God. Shall we pray? Indeed, Lord, as we gather together on this Good Friday to worship you, we want to give you thanks for this opportunity, an opportunity to gather as your, as your children, particularly in this difficult time that we find ourselves. And Lord, as we open our hearts and minds to you this morning, we do pray that you would, by your Spirit, Remove our fears, that you would ease our loneliness and, and reawaken our hope as we, as we take a moment to reflect on the cross of Jesus. So thank you that you receive us, that your yearning is to connect with us. And we do pray that our praise and worship this morning will honor you. And this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand with me then as we sing our first song this morning, Light of the World, a song that again brings us into the worship of Jesus this morning. Shall we stand and sing Light of the World?
invite us into a time of prayer. Let us pray. Lord, this morning we do praise you for your, for your life and particularly for the way in which you make life new. Thank you for the way in which you open our eyes to see the wonder of your world and our ears to listen to the song that creation sings to your glory. Father, thank you most of all for your Son, Jesus Christ. We praise you that through him you change our hearts, our minds, and our very lives. And on this day, we remember his, his life of goodness. We remember his, his many healings, his teaching and his extravagant love for everyone. And on this Good Friday, we particularly remember his death on the cross for us. And Lord, even though on that day he, he seemed defeated, we know that he was the one who won. Those who hated and rejected him, believed that they, had, that they had defeated him. But he was the one who was victorious. So we want to praise you for your love, which will never be defeated, and your concern for us and the world you created that will never come to an end. Thank you also, Lord, for those, for those who do love their neighbor, and for those who, who bring hope to many. Thank you for those who told us about Jesus and went on telling us until we finally listened. Thank you for your constant, relentless work in our hearts and in our lives. We ask you also, Lord, to forgive us when we find it so easy to give up and to give in. And as we <clears throat> reflect on our, on our journey, our life's journey, we, we acknowledge that we that we're willing to follow Jesus only until he gives us a cross to carry. Forgive us, Lord, and keep us faithful to Jesus so that our lives may be full with his victory. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Friends, I want to share with you from the Old Testament. The Old Testament, the, the prophet, of, prophet Isaiah writes, and he foretells about the first Good Friday, many, many years before it actually happened. He writes and he says, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured on that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So will he sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their eyes because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. 
like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we consider him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before a shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let's continue to worship God as we stand and sing our next song, Above All, Above All, Christ's crucifixion stands there for us. Let's stand and sing together.
going to invite Carol to continue leading us in our reflection to, uh, on the Word of God as she shares our New Testament scriptures with us this morning. Good morning, everyone. Our first reading is taken from 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, verses 9 to 12. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Our second reading is taken from John chapter 19, verses 16 to 42. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Gol Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side of Jesus, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the so soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So, th so this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was going to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs, their legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus, they found he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it was given has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of, the, what, one of his bones will be broken, and as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. 
Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 34 kilograms. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Thanks be to God for these words. Let us pray. Lord, as we come now to reflect on the events of this day, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you and that for Jesus' sake. Amen. And so as I've already said, we gather this morning to reflect and to celebrate the work of God through the cross of Jesus Christ. We have journeyed through Lent and Holy Week to the foot of the cross to reflect once again on what Christ achieved for us through his death, and particularly the impact it has on our lives today. So that it's not just a very sad event that happened a long time ago, which we think about once a year. There are many ways to describe the work of God through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, but, but when one boils it all down, it eventually comes down to just one thing, salvation. God has, through the cross of Jesus Christ, provided for our salvation. So this morning, I want to take a moment to reflect again on what it means to be saved. Now, I'm aware that, as Owen said before, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. But it is good to use this opportunity to remind us what the cross of Jesus is all about. And hopefully, as we take a moment to reflect on it, God will reveal something new to us. In fact, I I want to encourage you to, even now, in the quiet of your own heart, to ask God to reveal something new this morning. You see, when we come with that expectation the expectation to hear something new, the expectation to learn, more often than not, God is faithful to respond to that expectation. So what does it mean to be saved? Well, let me begin with a little story. And if you've heard it before, please just bear with me. The story is about the owner of a of a large pharmaceutical chain in America. In fact, it was the second largest. And he tells that after he was saved, he visited one of his pharmacies. And as he was strolling through the bookshelves, he noticed a number of pornographic magazines. He had seen them many times before, and it never bothered him. But now he he felt challenged to do something about it after he had received Christ as Savior. And so he calls his managing director and he, he tells him to remove all of the pornographic magazines from all his stores across the nation. Well, the director, of course, asked him if he was serious because they made over $3 million a year just from selling those magazines alone. But the owner was adamant. And a friend later asked him if it was his being saved that made him 
do this? And his response was, why else would I give up three million dollars? God just wouldn't let me off the hook. But then he went even further by challenging all the other main pharmaceutical chains to do the same. And in the beginning, there was very little response until more and more people started going to his stores because there was no pornography in them. And it wasn't long, and the other chains responded. And eventually, over 11,000 pharmacies across America had all their pornographic magazines removed. Not because a new law was made, but because someone gave their life to Jesus. And this little story tells us something of what it means to be saved. It's basically about changing your way of life. To hitch yourself in faith to God so that God's plan for your life can be accomplished. In this In the passage that Carol read to us from Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, he gives us three things about what it means to be saved. He is speaking about specific sins. And then he says, there was a time when some of you were just like that, but now your sins have been washed away and you have been set apart for God. You have been made right with God because of what the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God have done for you. Paul indicates that a transformation takes place, and that really, in a nutshell, is what salvation is all about, implying that that if there is no transformation, if, as Owen said on Wednesday evening, if there is no change in your priorities, if you don't begin to see the world through different eyes, if life just continues as it was before, then there is no salvation. So let's unpack what what Paul says about what it means to be saved. Let's look at these three things that he mentions. First he says to be saved, means to be washed, or as the NIV translation puts it, it means to be cleansed, to be cleansed from sin. Paul says, you were just like that, but, and that little word but has great significance because it indicates a clean break between what had gone before, and what follows. Cleansing from sin is the forgiveness of sins. To be saved means to be forgiven, to be forgiven by Christ. Paul put it like this in another letter he wrote, and this time the letter was written to the church in Ephesus. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. And the first step in forgiveness is to realize our need for it. And this is what confession really means. Agreeing with God about our sin and the need to be forgiven. You see, one of the greatest hindrances to salvation is realizing that we really need it. A a real threat to salvation is self-sufficiency. I don't need to be saved because I don't need God. I can take care of myself. I had that attitude before I was saved. I grew up in a Christian home, and so I knew there was a God, but I... I didn't need God. I wanted to live my life on my own terms. But there was always a a restlessness deep within my heart 
until the day I asked Jesus to forgive my sin. There wasn't a wow moment. No flashing lights or voices from heaven. Just a deep sense of peace. I had been cleansed from my sin through the blood of Christ. And this is what the prophet Isaiah was speaking about many, many years before Jesus went to the cross. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. A pastor said to a dying woman, Have you made peace with God? And she replied, No. Do you realize, he said, that you are dying and soon you must go to face God and give an account of your life? Yes, the woman replied. But I'm not disturbed about that. I do not have to make my peace with God. Christ made that peace for me on Calvary 2,000 years ago. I am simply resting in the peace which has already been made. Christ has already made that peace for us, which is the forgiveness or the cleansing from sin. So I ask you this morning, do you have that peace? Because God wants to give it to you. If not, you need only enter in enter into it through faith. Secondly, Paul says, to be saved means to be set apart for God. And the NIV speaks about being sanctified. It's a big word. It's a big Christian word, to be sanctified. But it simply means to be, separate, to be separated or set apart for God's use. In other words, to be set apart for service. At the time of our faith and belief, and belief in, in what Christ did for us on the cross, God not only forgives our sins, but also sets us apart for God's use. When COVID-19 hit, many businesses changed their work to help cope with the pandemic. For example, many restaurants and even bars didn't just close down. They didn't just stop receiving patrons. They changed to making and delivering food to the hungry and the destitute. Some businesses retooled to make ventilators for the many who were sick in hospital. They were, in other words, set apart for a new type of work. The entire purpose of their, of their tools and their machinery was changed. And so it is when someone is saved. The entire purpose of their life is changed. We've heard a lot about this over this, this last week. Nearly shared that we are to be extravagant in our love for Jesus, understanding that our love is expressed in service. Agnes reminded us that salvation requires nothing less than total surrender to the will of God. Owen reminded us that God sets apart each of us for a specific race that God has marked out for us. Which kind of adds another dimension to being sanctified. It's also a process. We grow in grace. And as I've said before, this is what we commit to through the act of baptism. We commit to participating in the mission of God, and this, this, dear friends, is not optional. 
every person who has been saved through the cross of Jesus Christ has a contribution to make in helping the church be the servant that God can use to spread the good news of the death and resurrection of Jesus. You and I have a contribution to make in helping NMC be a channel through which God can reach out to our community. As John Wesley said, spend and be spent for the sake of the gospel. After all, it's the only way that we can express our gratitude to God for God's extravagant gift of salvation. And so are you contributing to the work of God in the world or are you just a consumer? Lastly, Paul, Paul says to be saved means to be justified. Another big word. He says, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. To be justified, it's just a legal term, meaning to show right or, or to pronounce right. But this definition doesn't fully capture the essence of what it means to be justified by God through the cross of Jesus Christ. Because God doesn't just pronounce us right, but also makes us right. In other words, through the cross of Jesus Christ, God does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We are made right before God on the condition of our faith, our faith in God, and not by anything we do. In this sense, Jesus becomes our substitute. There's a story that comes out of the Holocaust when millions of Jews were, were killed by the Nazis. And, and the story was of a Christian woman who was, was known only by the name Mother Maria. And one day in the concentration camp, the Nazis were taking the Jews to, to the gas chambers. And a distraught mother refused to part with her baby. And when Mother Maria saw that the officer was only interested in numbers, she pushed the mother aside and quickly took her place. This is what Jesus did for us on the cross. In a sense, he pushed us aside and took our place. Dying so that we can be made right with God. It cost us nothing. But it cost Christ all he had. Are you right with God? Are you in a relationship with Jesus? What does it mean to be saved? It means forgiveness, sanctification, and justification. All big words describing different aspects of the same act. The act of salvation. Our salvation. Through a tree in the Garden of Eden... Adam gave the world death. Through another tree on Calvary, Jesus gave the world life. And this experience can be yours, simply accepted by faith. And so as I end, let me ask you again, do you have the peace that being made right with God offers? Have you surrendered your life completely to the service of God in the world? Have you been 
say. If you sense the Spirit of God speaking to you today, then heed the words of the prophet Isaiah. Let all the world look to me for salvation, for I am God. There is no other. There is no other way to be saved and inherit eternal life but through the cross of Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? I invite you into a moment of quiet reflection. O oh Lord, what you did for us on the cross is immense. In many ways, it is beyond our understanding. And yet this morning, as we reflect on it, we hear you calling. We hear you saying to each and every one of us, I did it for you. So Lord, as we continue to reflect, please help us to grow in our knowledge and understanding. Help us to be faithful to your call to be participants with you in your great task of reaching out to a world that is deeply troubled and disturbed. Help us to, to discern the contribution that you want each of us to make so that the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the only answer to all the world is facing, may go out. and reach the hearts of those who are still wandering around in the darkness. So Lord, please continue to be for us the light. Guide us. And this we pray and ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, I'm going to invite you to come and bring your offering uh, to God, uh, to God's work. Um, traditionally, the F Good Friday collection goes towards the Ministerial Students Fund in the Methodist Church. Um, and it is used to continue training ministers uh, for service in the Methodist Church. So I'm going to invite you to come and place your offerings in the baskets in front. While you're doing that, we'll be singing our next song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. When you have returned to your seat, simply remain standing and continue singing with us when I survey the wondrous cross.
Let us pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, we pray that you will open our eyes and help us to see the graciousness of your gift to us through Jesus Christ. Help us to truly evaluate your generosity toward us. And as you gave your best for us, even so today, we offer our best to you. Help us to bring the fruit of our love and our labor to the altar of worship. And may it all be used to your glory. May your blessing, Lord, be on these offerings. And may you bless not only the gifts, but also the givers. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Just one notice I want to share with you this morning to remind you of our Easter, su Easter Sunday service at 9 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Um, you're invited to bring along um, a bunch of flowers, if you like just to remember a loved one who has passed on. You're invited to do that and we'll decorate the sanctuary with those flowers and we'll spend a moment just in memory of our loved ones who have passed on and we'll do that on Sunday. You're also, I think, we are going to provide coffee if I, if I am correct. You're invited to bring a hot cross bun or two, and we'll just share it. We'll try and stick to protocol. <laughs> but Easter Sunday is an important day for us to celebrate together. And so we want to just spend a moment after our service just doing that for a short while. If you're not comfortable with doing that, you're most welcome um, to leave. Um, but we're inviting you to be a part of that. All right, let's spend a moment now in prayer for others. Let us pray. O oh Lord, this morning we do want to pray for those who walk in the way of Jesus. We think of those who refuse to compromise with evil and, and who stand firm in his name those who are committed to your kingdom of love and peace. And yes, Lord, those who are willing to pay the price of naming the name of Jesus with their lips and their lives. Oh Lord, this morning we think of our many brothers and sisters across the world where they are not free to worship like we are. Where they are persecuted and hated because of the name of Jesus. We pray for them. We pray for the victory of joy. Lord, we also think of those this morning who, who rule the nations of the world, those who have the power to bring peace or the determination to wage war those who listen only to popular opinion and those whose ears are open to God. Those, Lord, who seek new hope for everyone and for those seeking only power for themselves. Lord, in this troubled world, we pray for the victory of honesty, truth, and justice for all. We think also, Lord, this morning of those whose hearts and minds are filled with violence, those whose actions bring pain and confusion to many. And this morning we think of those involved in warfare, those who see only the cause for which they are fighting and not the price others are paying in their heartache and in the destruction of all that matters to them. We think this morning particularly, Lord, of our neighbor, Mozambique, where so much destruction and displacement has happened in the lives of many. 
Lord, this morning we pray for the victory of peace. And then, Lord, we also want to pray for those who are ill, for the lonely, the lost, and the despairing. We think of all those who mourn and for those whose ambitions have come to nothing. For those who at this time are experiencing loss of work, loss of home, loss of freedom, even loss of courage and love. For those whose Lives now feel empty and for whom joy is a thing of the past. O oh Lord, we, we pray for the victory of hope. And then finally, Lord, we again pray for ourselves. As Christ triumphed over sin and death for us, and turn the world's understanding of victory upside down. So we pray, Lord, touch our lives with your love and transform them by the power of your Spirit. Use even us, Lord, our lives, our words, and our deeds. Use us, we pray, as a message of hope to our neighbors. O oh Lord, May your light shine in us and through us and bring honor and glory to your name. And this is our prayer. For we pray it in the name of him who died for us all, even Jesus Christ. Amen. So friends, as we end our time together, I just want to remind you that we do not sing the benediction after this service. I will simply announce it, and you are encouraged to leave the sanctuary in silence. And then we meet again on Sunday. But before I announce the benediction, let's end with our last song this morning, The Wonder of Your Cross.
Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. In the power of the Spirit, go into the world, serve the Lord, and witness to him. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace until the power of the Holy Spirit fills you to overflowing with joy and with hope. Amen. <laughs>